All right, Gospel Backgrounds 38. We are looking at Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus. We're in Jericho in Luke 18 and Matthew 20. So we have a unique Acts 1711 challenge for this lesson. As I was going through different commentaries, I came across two opposing and yet I would say equally compelling views for the explanation of the parable of the minas, which we can find in Luke 19. So we'll take a look at both and then you can put your Acts 1711 thinking caps on to analyze. And I would say just as going into this, uh, perhaps both are true and both have their applications. So our topics for this lesson, we'll look at Blind Bartimaeus and Lancaster had an interesting comparison with Blind Bartimaeus and the rich young ruler. So we'll take a look at that. We'll look at uh, Zacchaeus, the short of stature tax collector in Jericho. And then we'll con conclude by looking at those journey parables. Um, in some r renderings, they're a single parable. Lancaster views them as kind of two different parables mixed together into one. So we have the parable of the minas or sometimes called the parable of the pounds. And that's awfully similar to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. And then there's also the parable of the king's return. So we'll take a look at all that. So usually we start with geographic background, but in, th in this lesson, each of the readings start with this reference to Jericho. So let's look at that first. So Matthew 20 says, as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. Mark 10 says basically the same thing, but Luke says, as he drew near Jericho, and then all this happens. So take a look at what's going on here. So this lesson takes place in and around the city of Jericho. And it's interesting that Jericho is only about 15 miles from Jerusalem, but in a lot of respects, they couldn't be more opposite. As you can see from the map on the right, that's a, a, a elevation map. So anything blue is going to be below sea level. And so you can see Jericho is about 900 feet below sea level, lies deep in the Jordan Rift Valley. It's the deepest um, rift in the in, entire earth. And, and the, the Dead Sea is actually the lowest point in the earth, about 1300 feet below sea level, compared to Jerusalem, which is high in the Judean hills at about uh, 2500 feet above sea level. So really close, yet uh, very high in elevation. We've talked about that previously. In Jericho, fresh water is plentiful. There are lots of springs. In fact, Jericho is known as the city of palms because it's very much an oasis in the desert. And you can see on the, on the picture on the left there. Whereas Jerusalem's only source of fresh water is the Gihon Spring, and it can only provide water for maybe a few thousand people per year. So a very, very small spring compared to the very well-watered Jericho. And finally, uh, Jericho commands the central east-west approach to Jerusalem, making it strategically quite important. Um, and it just had a lot of tax revenue. The Jordan was easy to cross at, at this point. So um, this probably contributed to the wealth of Zacchaeus, the tax collector who was able to tax people both coming and going. So whereas this, despite having tremendous religious importance, Jerusalem was not in any kind of strategic location, nor was it particularly wealthy. So here's a picture of Jericho. And I think we might've mentioned last time there were actually two different centers. So what we call uh, Tel S. Sultan today is the Old Testament city of Jericho. And then maybe about a mile away is, is the Herodian complex. So one was the population center and the other was the administration administrative center. And uh, uh, Dr. Boland writes, by comparing this story with that found in Matthew 20, it is apparent that Jesus was leaving the population center of Jericho as described in Matthew and then entering the area of the Herodian city as recorded in Luke. So we don't need to worry about the fact that one says coming and the other says going. Uh, we can reconcile those quite easily. So our setting here is a little over a week before Passover. So it's you know we're heading up to the final climax of Jesus's earthly ministry here. So we can picture that crowds are beginning to swell. They're probably growing along Jesus's path as he moved south uh, along the Jordan River. And now uh at the bottom of the mountain is this ascent that begins up to jerusalem and so we can kind of picture that it's more much more narrow so there is probably was like a bottleneck of people waiting to begin that trail out of jericho and up to jerusalem and per perhaps not exclusively but definitely not unrelated to jesus was the fact that this Passover, expectation was high for a messianic deliverer. Now, such hope is always higher around Passover. That feast recalls Israel's miraculous deliverance from the oppressive Egypt. And uh, with, with Jesus as God's messenger, those who saw that had every reason to think that a similar deliverance was at hand. 
Matthew 20, verse 30. And behold, two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And note that Mark tells us the man's name, Bartimaeus. And it's interesting that Mark and Luke just record one beggar, whereas Matthew has two beggars. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it's interesting that Mark gives us the name uh, of the man, Bartimaeus. Most of the time, people who Jesus healed are usually unnamed. So this might suggest that Bartimaeus became uh, you know, a sort of a celebrity figure in the early apostolic community. So who knows there? Mark also translates the man's name for us. Um, his Roman readership would not necessarily have spoken Hebrew or Aramaic. So he tells us that uh, Bartimaeus means the son of Timaeus. So Bar in Aramaic means son. And so the man's name means the son of Timaeus. So the healing is relatively straightforward. Uh, and it could be easy to miss some nuances, but let's take a look at a few. So Mark and Luke record that he is told Jesus of Nazareth passes by. So Yeshua was actually a very common name, uh, but there is only one Yeshua of Nazareth. So Nazareth was a very small town um, that was unmistakable who that was. Bartimaeus next makes a messianic declaration when he exclaims, son of David, have mercy on me. So in other words, although this man was blind, he could actually see better than most people of his day. Uh, he saw Jesus clearly, which is, again, a contrast to people who might have passed vision tests just fine, but they still could not see that Jesus was the son of David. So we note this discrepancy. Matthew says there were two blind men, whereas Mark and Luke only say there was one. I don't think this is an issue. Matthew occasionally will uh, say there was there were multiple people involved in an incident whereas Mark and Luke would say there's only one. Um, I, I remember Matthew was an eyewitness to these events where the other writers may have heard it secondhand and they may have edited their stories only to focus on the more significant individual. So if they had said there was only Bartimaeus there, then we would have more of a problem. But I think we can easily reconcile this by saying Jesus came upon two blind men, one of whom was named Bartimaeus. And I actually don't mind discrepancies like these because they, they do demonstrate a lack of collusion among the gospel writers. So it's it's sort of like, you know, you're watching a football game and you have four different views of the action. Um, this is what the gospel writers provide for us. So we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each writing with their own perspectives and each crafting their words for what they want their readers to see. In stopping, Jesus called to them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes. They immediately recovered their sight and followed him. So you have to admire their persistence here. So they shouted louder, and uh, the crowd was telling them to be quiet. And, and then they knew exactly what they needed. So he didn't ask Jesus for a few coins, even though he's begging. He asked to be healed. So that's just a reminder to make sure our prayers are specific. So it's interesting, this time there's no elaborate ritual. He doesn't have to make mud or some kind of concoction. Um, his touch is all the man needed to be healed. And then Jesus, of course, commends them for their faith, and then they immediately follow him. So that's 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 beautiful. So these types of healings are, are commonplace. You know, by this stage, we're at the end, uh, of, you know, coming up on the, the final week of Jesus. And so I think for Mark particularly, he records these events that demonstrate Jesus' authority over the physical world. So that's one thing he wants to show. If you look at um, many of the healings Mark records, they're they're all on on the physical, uh, you know, things that that would just wouldn't normally happen. And then, as Lancaster says, these infirmities, uh, healings of these infirmities, symbolize Jesus' struggle with the spiritual impediments besetting his generation. These impediments prevented the people from repenting, recognizing the Messiah and obtaining the kingdom. So it's, it's, this man's blindness is representative of that generation's blindness. Lancaster concludes this section in his commentary with the table comparing the rich young ruler to Bartimaeus. And I've modified this slightly, but I, I think it's interesting when you uh, compare these side by side. So a rich young man was uh, wealthy, whereas Bartimaeus was destitute. Um, the rich young man's address was good teacher, in other words, polite and reserved. Whereas blind Bartimaeus approached urgently, son of David, have mercy on me. Um, the, the rich young man's request was, what must I do? Jesus' reply is quite different, right? He, uh, if Maybe if the rich young man had, had taken an approach of, you know, Jesus 
you know, make sure I have eternal life, then the answer would have been different. But because the man says, what must I do? Then Jesus responds, well, if you're going to do it on your own, then you have to keep the commandments and sell everything. Um, and did he? The answer, of course, is no in the rich young ruler's case. And it's interesting, blind Bartimaeus, he not only did he follow Jesus, he left his cloak aside. So in other words, this might have been the only thing he owned. So he did leave everything and follow Jesus. So there's an interesting turnabout there. And then the mood after was sad. And I, as I mentioned last time, I think Jesus was sad too, because when someone you love makes a poor decision, that makes you sad. And this caused the disciples to, you know, to be concerned, like who can be saved? Uh, whereas Bartimaeus' reaction glorified God and he caused others to be awed and praise God. So just the, the power of making the right choice and how that can be a, a testimony to God and, and cause others to pray God. And then the lesson is when we depend on our adequacy and our righteousness, we go away sad. But when we humble ourselves enough to ask for mercy, we are rewarded. Luke 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was so small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed into up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he, Jesus, was about to pass that way. So Jericho was one of the wealthiest cities around, and for this man to be the chief tax collector, that means he was probably extremely wealthy. Uh, we've talked in uh, previous lessons about how tax collectors were shunned. They were at the bottom rung of society. So this is setting the stage for another last shall be first reversal. Um, and basically, I won't go into it too much. I've got some more comments on the website, but it, it was like a pyramid scheme. And Zacchaeus would have been at the top of that scheme. What they would do is they would sell the business uh, the Romans would sell the business to the highest bidder, and then whatever the tax collector got in a, above that, um, they would keep for themselves. So it was very pretty much a shady business. Jesus himself once said that his disciples should treat the unrepentant as if they were tax collectors. So that, that means to shun them. So these guys were not liked in Jewish society. So this is a picture of a Middle Eastern sycamore tree, and it's actually a type of a fig tree. So it's not our North American sycamore tree. Um, in the Middle East, these trees have short trunks and branches close to the ground, making them easy to climb. And just from a cultural standpoint, just like today, you know, we consider climbing trees to be a, a kid's activity and not, a, not you know, one that a respectable person would do. So in a sense, by elevating himself up a tree, uh, Zacchaeus was lowering himself in the eyes of others because it's just, you know, grownups don't climb trees. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. There's a wider shot of the Middle Eastern sycamore. So imagine all the people who want to see Jesus. It'd be like a, a motorcade today where just people are lining the streets hoping to get a glimpse. And so not only does Jesus stop and call someone out for special attention, that person happens to be you know, a hated tax collector. So again, a first, first shall be last. Luke has a number of these stories that uh, would juxtapose a repentant sinner um, contrasted against the murmuring and complaining of the self-righteous. So we see that again here. So Zacchaeus probably was well known to the city's people and not in a good way. And they were probably asking, why would Jesus choose to honor this low life, this, you know, this thief? Uh, any food that he might serve would have been purchased with stolen money. And so doesn't that make Jesus you know, is Jesus agreeing with this or kind of what's going on here? So Zacchaeus was a symbol of all that was wrong with the Roman oppression. Uh, he was supposed to be ostracized and hated, but then Jesus isn't playing by the rules. So conversely, uh, we can imagine the town's religious leaders expected Jesus to dine with them. So maybe they had already started preparing their houses just for the hopes that they would get called on to entertain this critical guest. And that's not what happens. So this happens, uh, this event happened right around the time Jesus told the parable of the workers. So again, something very similar. The owner can choose uh, on whom to be, bestow favor. So he has that option. So the, the, the people didn't like whom Jesus chose, even though it wasn't their decision, and yet they grumbled. So I, I see some similarities here with that last parable.
keep in mind that these people weren't as uh, they weren't they weren't being petty in their dislike for Zacchaeus. I mean, he 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 earned their uh, their wrath with reason. He was a thief, and they had probably all been victimized by him. And Zacchaeus really made their lives harder than they needed to be. So you know, they had to work harder for less because of the Roman tax system. Jesus, of course, he knows the end from the beginning, and he knows what's going to happen next. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So I imagine the, those who were grumbling were quite surprised the next day if, if they got a knock on the door and were handed a bag of cash four times the amount that they'd initially been uh, overcharged. So I, I, I suppose that made them quite happy that Jesus spent some time with them. So note that the man repented from exploiting others. And given what John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, uh, I don't think we can necessarily assume that this man gave up being a tax collector. Because when a group of repentant tax collectors came to John the Baptist, they say, what do we need to do? And John the Baptist essentially said, stop overcharging people. He doesn't tell them to stop being tax collectors. So, um, so there's, there's that thought, too. He didn't necessarily leave everything behind and, and quit his business. He did, however, repent. And the Hebrew word for repentance is a good one to know. It's called teshuva. And as with many Hebrew words, action is implied. Oftentimes, when we think of repentance, we just think of a change of heart. But in the Hebraic mindset, that change of heart is always accompanied by an action. And so in this case, a good deed that reflects the individual's repentance. And we touched on this last time with the rich young ruler. In Zacchaeus's case, his heart was right, so the good deeds followed. In the young man's case, Jesus proved that his heart wasn't right, despite his claim to have kept all the commandments. And so, you know, he didn't have a good deed to back it up with. And what's interesting is that there's a potential that both exchanges with the rich young ruler and with Zacchaeus might have happened on the same day, which would have highlighted the contrast in the disciples' eyes. The Torah assigns various levels of repayment for theft, depending on the specific circumstances. And so it's interesting to note that the, the highest payment is for an animal, you know, like a farm animal, and it's four to five times damages. And so really Zacchaeus gave himself the highest level of penalty, which would be the quadruple damages. When Jesus says today salvation has, has come, this is not because of the good deed of giving his goods away to the poor and, and remediating uh, with the damages. Salvation came just like it does for us because of his repentance. And that was sub subsequently evidenced by the, his acts of good deeds. So Zacchaeus would have undoubtedly been familiar with John the Baptist in this region. And so we mentioned on the last slide, you know, John, some, there were some repentant tax collectors. Maybe those guys worked for Zacchaeus. So maybe a seed was planted and that took some time to grow. We just don't know. And, and I think we need to remember this whenever we don't see any immediate fruit for our ministry, there could be growth going on that we don't see. And again, that's all speculation, but you know, perhaps John the Baptist's words were kind of percolating in Zacchaeus' mind. And then once he saw Jesus, he realizes he needed to have a, a change of direction. So there's also a deliberate pun here when Jesus says, today salvation has come because Yeshua means salvation. So not only was Zacchaeus saved in the spiritual sense, uh, Jesus, the embodiment of salvation, had also come to his house and was sitting directly across from him. Calling him a son of Abraham is also significant. Um, we've talked about before, Jesus came to save the lost sheep of Israel. And so Zacchaeus was one of those lost sheep, thought to be beyond reach. Yet Jesus restores him. Um, many people uh, of that day, and just like many Christians today, believe that they have salvation just by virtue of being saved, be, being raised in the church, or in that day being Jewish. And uh, in that day, they believe that could be forfeited by self-exclusion, such as if one became a tax collector. So uh, in, in their minds, uh, Zacchaeus had forfeited his right to uh, eternal life, and uh, Jesus is correcting them here. If we entertain the fact that he remained a tax collector, this inclusion and restoration is all the more offensive to those in attendance because previous lessons we've discussed this divine reversal, including the last lesson where those who showed up for work at the 11th hour got the same wage who had been there all day. So here's this, this tax collector, this man who's done mostly evil. He has one uh, 
example of repentance and Jesus says today salvation has come. So that was, you know, kind of startling to those who had been maybe all their lives. They, they'd done the, done the commandments and lived good lives. And yet, so there he's getting the same as me. And that just seems kind of unfair. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem, because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. So as we evaluate these parables, we need to keep in mind Jesus's stated reasoning, reasoning for telling the parables. And that comes the last part of verse 11. They suppose that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So we need to kind of keep that in mind as we as we move forward. So here's a close-up of that pilgrimage road, the ascent of Adumim, which leads from Jericho and goes up to Jerusalem, and we can see some of the Roman uh, remains still there today. So this is another one of these journey parables. So man goes on a journey, he leaves some stewards in charge, and then he comes back unexpected and expects accounting. An accounting. So for the original audience, I think there's at least three applications. So first is uh, the, the call for individual accountability in the absence of direct supervision. I think that's kind of clear. But on a more spiritual level, I think there might have been two others that Jesus was communicating. And again, keep in mind that he's telling this in response to the fact that they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So I think impartially Jesus is communicating that after his resurrection, Jesus will be away for a while, right? So the disciples, you and me, are in, in, you know, today you and me are entrusted with not only keeping the operation moving, but also delivering a return on, on investment. When he comes again, um, not only will the wicked be judged at the great white throne judgment, but then our deeds will have our works evaluated at the Bema Seat judgment. And second, more specific to that generation, I think he's explaining the coming judgment that's about to fall on Jerusalem. So they're expecting, you know, the, the, a man conquering Jerusalem on a white horse and overthrowing the Romans. And Jesus is hinting that it's not going to be like that um, because Moses gave them a near perfect system for staying in communion with God. And in, in many ways, the Torah is written as if it's a contract. It promises life to those who fulfill the terms and death to those who do not. So now Jesus, in a sense, is returning. He is the ruler who's returning and asking for an accounting, and they're going to be found a little bit lacking here. Uh, if that generation had produced fruit in keeping with repentance, then Jesus' arrival might have indeed uh, brought in the uh, messianic kingdom that they were seeking. But since he found that generation failed to fulfill the terms, his appearance then brings judgment. So destruction, exile, and a uh, indefinite delay of the kingdom. So I think all that could be going on here. So we, we said that Jesus told these parables in response that, uh, that they expected the kingdom immediately. So I think both of these would serve to communicate, you know, however indirectly that, you know, Jesus is not the Messiah they're looking for. So both senses would convey that there's no immediate messianic kingdom on the horizon. What makes this complex is that uh, Luke may have combined two parables into one. So both of them begin with a nobleman went into a far country. And so when in Lancaster's commentary, he calls one of them the parable of the minas. And that bears a lot of resemblance to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. So that would be um, the parable of the minas would be Luke, uh, versus, Luke 19 verses 12, 13 the second half of 15b through 26. And then the second parable would be the parable of the king's return. So there's two different things going on here. The king was rejected by his citizens in Luke 12, uh, 14, and the first part of 15, and then concludes in 27. So both parables begin with a nobleman going out into a far country to receive his kingdom. What is interesting about this is that, as Keener points out, Herod the Great in 40 BCE and Herod Archelaus in 4 BCE each had to go to Rome to receive their right to rule over Judea. So Jesus' audiences would have immediately recalled this. In other words, when they heard the opening words of the parable, they would have thought, oh, you mean just like Herod and Archelaus. So this nobleman is immediately cast in a negative light because of the comparison to um, Herod and Herod Archelaus. <clears throat> 
He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. So here's a picture of a mina, and a, a mina, interestingly enough, weighs uh, almost two pounds. And so it's more like a weight, <laughs> um, which, you know, weights and measures are, are kind of sometimes used interchangeably here. So it was roughly three months wages. So as kind of is the theme with man goes on a journey parables, the workers are given an unannounced time to grow their investments. And although it's not stressed in this parable, with the journey parables, the master usually returns unannounced. So this means the workers should constantly be in a heightened state of preparedness and expectation, regardless of the length of the master's absence. The first came before him, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minas, meaning doesn't he have enough? And the master said, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So it's interesting that although 10 servants were given a mina each, we were only told really the audit results of three of them. The first two must have had tremendous asset managers. The return on investment was you know 1000% and 500% respectively. And so even today we would say those are incredible returns and perhaps too good to be true. And that leads into something I'll touch on in a second. Um, so then they, they had these returns, they were put in charge over much more, um, very similar to the parable of the talents uh, in Matthew 25, and we'll look at that separately. The third one, however, wrapped his mina up in a scarf. And in that culture, wrapping up in a scarf uh, meant, uh, kind of laying it away, meant that it couldn't be touched. So basically he was just preserving it for safekeeping, not intending to grow it. So this parable draws obvious comparisons to Matthew 25 and the parable of the talents. And I've got a little bit of it here. It's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, there's a couple of differences. In Matthew's version, there are three servants, not 10. The currency is interestingly a talent and a talent is, is actually another weight, but it's equivalent to 6,000 denarii. So 23 to 25 years wages, so a very significant sum. Uh, instead of each servant getting equal, the three servants in Matthew get five, two, and one um, talents respectively. The first two deliver 100% return on investment and are told, well done, good and faithful servant. You were, you were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The third servant responds much like the third servant in the Mina parable. The servant buried the talent in the ground because of the custom of that day it was that one entrusted with another's money could not be liable for its theft if he buried it in a ground. So there's some cultural things going on here. The master then took his talent and gave it to the one with 10 talents. So Lancaster concludes, if the parable of the 10 minas describes how equal opportunities can be used differently to achieve different results, the parable of the talents describes how different opportunities and resources can be used equally to achieve the same results. So uh, strikingly, the third servant is not merely reprimanded. Here he is cast into Gehenna, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the message here is stronger. Those who do not use their resources to serve God will be punished in Gehenna. So note the difference here, though, is it says the, the, the good servants are told to enter into the joy of your master. And that phrase is actually missing from the Luke version. So five cities uh, recalls the five Philistine cities that we read about during the time of David. And um, this is a picture of Ashkelon, one of the, the five cities. This is a very, very cool national park that has some um, very old uh, remains. It's very cool to visit. So the prevailing view assumes that the parable in Luke 
It is roughly equivalent to the parable in Matthew. The two were rewarded while the one was punished. And if we are faithful in small things, Jesus will reward us with more important things. And as for the seemingly impossible rate of return, this could be, you know, explained away by saying that with man, such a return is impossible, at least not without fraud. But with God, all things are possible. And so a takeaway here is Jesus doesn't want us coasting. If we're his disciples, his servants, he expects us to produce good works while he is away. Again, we don't do these to get saved, but we do these things because we are saved. The scribes uh, recount similar lessons with Moses and David. Both started out as shepherds leading literal four-legged sheep. Because they proved themselves faithful, God put them over his people Israel. So God tests us in small matters each day and then you know, as if to say, do you trust me? Uh, and then, um, then this builds on to being faithful and those little tests helps us pre prepare us for maybe some more extensive trials. So with some modifications, this is Lancaster's conclusion of the Ten Mina. So the king is Messiah. The journey is Messiah's absence. So between perhaps uh, the, the time between Moses and Jesus' first coming or between the time of the crucifixion and Jesus' second coming, kind of both, both things uh, work equally here. So the servants are disciples or Israel, you and me. Uh, the minas are commandments, demands of the kingdom. Um, how are we doing with loving our neighbor and, and those types of things? Faithful servants would be disciples who are focused on the kingdom. Unfaithful servants would be those who have neglected the work of the kingdom, uh, punishment reward or loss or advancement of the kingdom. And so the meaning is those faithful with the responsibilities entrusted to them will be rewarded at the coming of the Messiah. Those who are negligent will be punished. And again, this could have applied um, very much to Jesus' first coming where, you know, Jesus entered in Jerusalem, he was rejected. And so those would be equivalent of this, the servants who didn't grow their investments while Jesus was away. So we mentioned that the parable of the king's return might stand on its own. Maybe Luke mashed these two together into one parable. But if we split them out, then this is how uh, we might render the parable of the king's return. A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. His citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. He returned having received the kingdom and said, for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. When he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As we mentioned, hearers of this parable would have immediately recalled the Herodian ruler Archelaus. So when, when they heard a nobleman went into a far country to receive his kingdom, you know, they would have they would have thought, oh, you mean just like Herod did and just like Archelaus did. And then when they further heard his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, they would have said, oh, you mean just like Archelaus? Because one Passover, Archelaus slaughtered approximately 3,000 Jews in the temple. And then following this, a delegation of Judeans made the trek to Rome to petition for relief. Ultimately, the Romans agreed with the people and banished Archelaus to Vienna. And then that's when the age of the Roman procurators began. And so you can see the map for these boundaries. Um, so I think a question is, why would Jesus, you know, if, if we assume the ruler is Jesus, why would he be comparing himself to the wicked Archelaus? And why would he talk about, you know, bring them here and slaughter them before me? That doesn't sound like Jesus. Um, as we've mentioned, uh, there's, there's a couple of different explanations here. So Jesus' parables often have flawed protagonists. So it could be the, the grumpy neighbor or the unjust judge or the, the fraudulent steward. Um, one of those lessons is if a flawed human being can do good things like reward productive servants, how much more would a perfect God do those things? So that, that's one, um, one possible explanation. Next is he said these things as he was going up to Jerusalem. So he, we have this kind of book ended with, you know, the beginning was they expected the, the kingdom to be immediate. And then, you know, we're told that he told these things as he was going up to Jerusalem. So the spirit wanted us to know this connection to Jerusalem. Um, what he knew, Jesus knew, but the disciples did not, is that at Jerusalem, he would be rejected and hated. So one other explanation is while we as believers don't view Jesus as an evil ruler, non-believers do not share our opinions, right? They're at enmity with him uh, and enmity with him. <laughs> so um, basically the Jerusalem religious establishment, all the other non-believers, you know, they hated 
Jesus. And so in, in that respect, we could view Jesus as the hated ruler. So we could say that in this interpretation, the parable's meaning is that judgment awaits those who oppose the kingdom. Um, the That generation rejected Jesus and they were going to be sent into exile. They're gonna have Jerusalem destroyed. If we've read Revelation, we know that when Jesus comes again, his enemies will be put down and, and God wins. So there's uh, there's that view of it. As we've said above, the, the journey parables, uh, Jesus' first coming as well as his second coming could be in view here. Although they are successful at having Jesus cast aside, really in about 40 years, the Romans will invade and slaughter the residents of Jerusalem. And then those who are you know, fortunate enough to survive are sent into exile. So either way, judgment awaits those who reject the rightful ruler. Um, Jesus is also dropping a hint that the Messianic kingdom will have to wait. So if we compare Luke's parables here with Matthew's, we can get the impression that even though the ruler is flawed and not liked, you know, Jesus could have been talking of himself, his time away, he expects uh, uh, good accounting. Now, with that said, I, I was researching and I came across a very compelling alternative view, and I wanted to share it with you. So again, Acts 17.11, don't believe anything I say, but check it out for yourself. And it's possible that in, in some sense, both of these interpretations are valid. So let's look at what Aubrey Taylor writes in the Luxem Geographic Commentary. When the setting of the parable is accounted for, it becomes clear Jesus is delivering a critique of exploitative power structures not celebrating them as a model of discipleship. So let's unpack this alternate view. So here you can see a nice aerial shot uh, with Jericho in the foreground, Jerusalem in the background, and you can see the steep climb through the mountains that uh, travelers had to go and, and that ascent of Adamim. So um, very, very rugged terrain there. So the alternative view here hinges on the comparison of the ruler in the parable to Herod Archelaus. And then also when we take in context the geographic setting. So we're in Jericho, we're in view of Herod's palaces and we're on our way up to Jerusalem. So a, a couple of slides ago, we asked why would, if Jesus is the protagonist of the story, he's telling it about himself, why would he compare himself to the very wicked and hated Archelaus? So Taylor's answer is that Jesus wouldn't make that comparison. In the economy of that day, Taylor notes the very act of doing business for profit was considered immoral, and the profit margins presented by the first two servants were downright evil. Unlike today's economy, where I would say a right, we, we tend to think a rising tide lifts all boats. In that day, it really was seen as a zero sum. If one person gained, that meant another person lost. So Taylor's point is in that culture, the noblemen, especially with the setup that Jesus provided, the noblemen would have been the enemy. The third slave would have actually been the hero because of this passive resistance. Um, that that the servant gave and you know didn't didn't actually help the landowner but didn't didn't do anything wrong either. So to generate those massive returns, the speculation is that the first two slaves would have had to resort to some kind of harassment or thievery. And, and uh, I'm sympathetic because even today, if someone showed an a, a thousand percent return or a five hundred percent return, you know, that would probably get the SEC's attention, right? There there were probably some shenanigans or maybe the asset manager received an insider trading tip or something like that. It just you don't you just don't see returns like that. So it's it's kind of um, you know kind of abnormal. So with this interpretation, it's the third slave who acted honorably. He didn't directly disobey the wicked ruler, but he doesn't do anything to help him either. And Taylor sees this interpretation as more fitting in the context of the story following Zacchaeus, who gave away all of his ill-gotten earnings. Taylor also notes that he, he told this parable because they were near to Jerusalem and because they supposed the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. In other words, they wanted a, a national kingdom to replace Rome. Jesus, according to this view, responds that it would be absurd to establish the kingdom of God based on the model of Rome. And what's interesting is that in, in Jewish history, their recent history bore this out. So we, you probably are aware they celebrate Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is when they threw off the tyrannical uh, Syrian Greeks known as the Seleucid Empire. So this unlikely victory that um, basically they they were allowed to rule themselves for uh, you know a few decades. 
only a few decades after this miraculous you know delivering of a, of a victory israel's own rulers were basically just as ruthless corrupt and incompetent as their greek counterparts so they they didn't really gain anything by this great victory in the long run so uh taylor's view is jesus would show us a different way he enters jerusalem not on a conquering horse but on a hum humble donkey and you know in the midst of a crowds calling out for a king uh or uh, and rescuer you know they wanted they wanted a political king they all wanted a political empire um jesus realized his message was falling on deaf ears so there's that that's a little more uh in depth of a, a takeaway but again i present it just just because i, I, I found it interesting So I like to give uh, the most weight to what the original audience would have understood. And when I read Taylor's argument, that kind of appealed to me because I think uh, what they wonder, would have understood is, you know, the, the ruler was wicked, just like Archelaus. So with that said, the parable of uh, Matthew 25 and the comparisons to Luke 19 can't be ignored, right? Uh, the context of Matthew's parable is clearly a good and faithful servant who enters into his master's joy. Um, so that's, you know, clearly uh, speaking of J Jesus and the kingdom and, you know, being faithful in the small things, being faithful in the big things, and then getting rewarded um, at the end. Luke's parable is almost identical to that, that one. So with a few words, um, th there's not that many differences. So perhaps while they appear conflicting, maybe the two interpretations aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, parables usually only have one takeaway, but th that, that doesn't always have to be the case. So uh, again, is this a praise for diligent servants or a warning to those expecting a political kingdom, or perhaps it's both? I think more applicable to us though, is we need to have the heart of Zacchaeus. When we are wrong, we need to joyfully uh, make it right because salvation has come to us as well. So that is uh, the last of our lessons uh before jesus final week and now we are about to enter the triumphal entry which we will get to next time